kép, amit Anita itt felvázolt ebben a genderünkben, az elmúlt 30 esztendőben, egy bizonyos értelemben tehát feltehető a kérdés, hogy előre látható volt te vagy sem. Na most azt kell mondani, hogy azok a társadalmatudósok, akik megmaradtak a marxista elemzés akkori színvonalán, nem a mait mondom, az akkori színvonalán, ami nem volt nagyon alacsony szintű a neoliberalizmus Magyarországi elméleteivel egybevetve, gyakorlatilag előre volt látható, hogy be fog következni a régi rendszer kriminalizálása, előre volt látható, hogy egy, egy óriási szellemi hamisításnak fog kellene végig menni, és egy történelmi hamisításnak kell végbe menni, amivel elleplezik az új tekinté uralmi rendszerek létrejöttét. Ha véletlen valaki az eszmélet első számait fellapozza, mondjuk, mert annyira unatkozik, vagy valami más miatt, belelapoz, akkor azt látja, hogy minden alapvető momentumban a történelmi fejlődés fővonala látható terület. Tehát aki most azon gyilvánkozik, hogy Kelet-Közép-Európában, Baltikumtól, lefele Horvátországi, nem beszélek most Ukrajnáról, ahol egy pronáci diktatúra jön létre, csak ebben a régióban, akik az Orbán kriminalizálják azokkal szemben, azt állítom, hogy az egész régióban mindenütt végbe ment úgy, ahogy előre lehetett látni 89-92 között egy tekinti uralmi nacionalista rezsimek berendezkedése. Tehát semmi meglepő nem játszódik le, amiről beszélt az Anita, én ezekre a folyamatokra jól emlékszem, ezek adalék ehhez a kulturális, szellemi, politikai, társadalmi anyatlások. Minél erősebb ez a hanyatlás, minél erősebb a nacionalista dominancia kibontakozása Kelet-Európában, annál tisztában lehet látni, hogy az új tekinti uralmi rendszer a tiltás, a diktatórikus vonások erősítése irányába kell, hogy elmenjen, mert különben alternatíva nyílik balra. Tehát továbbra is az a gondolatkör uralja az új hierarchiák létrejöttével, az a gondolat uralja az elitet, hogy még mindig tartani kell attól, hogy a magyar, a kelet-európai lakosság előbb-utóbb nem jobb és szélső jobb irányba fog tájékozódni, hanem baloldali irányt vehet ez a gondolkodás. Erősek azok a hagyományok. Na most mi ezeket a hagyományokat persze ápoljuk, hiszen most is azért jöttünk össze, hogy el ne felejtsük a szervezeti konzekvenciáját az összejövetelünknek, és hogy mit jelent a félperiférián ez a rezim, ennek az új kapitalizmusnak, az új adigarikus kapitalizmusnak a berendezkedése. Ennek az okairól és összefüggéseiről biztos sok mindent fogunk hallani. A maxi gondolat köp, mint az egész világra a, a, a forma elméletét kiterjesztjük az egész világra. Tehát a centrum, a félperiféria, a periféria egész gondolat köre, ami Tőkei Ferenc közvetítésével jön át ide be Kelet-Európába és az egész világon. Most ez a gondolat rendkívül gyümölcsöző, és mint a következő előadásból ki fog derülni, a marxizmusnak éppen ez az iránya rengeteg tapasztalatot ad a mai tájékozódó, tájékozódni akaró emberek számára, akik, ut akik utat keresnek a rendszeren túl, nem akarnak lerögzülni valamiféle új, jóléti állam és egyéb más utópiák világába, hanem reálisan szembe akarnak azzal nézni, hogy milyen világrendszerben élünk. Ehhez nyújt ma Marx elképesztően fontos támogatást. Marcello Musto. I would like to... I would have liked to... Uh, express my thanks for the invitation and um, this coming. Perhaps a little bit uh, the volume where I can put this up. I wanted to, um, while I scream so, uh, express my thanks. I would have expressed my thanks. Can you hear now? Is it better? Or Not perhaps you special. can help me with this? Uh, yeah. With maximum in your So I would I'd like to be very generous about the thanks and spend a lot of time to say how happy I am to be here 
Um, and uh, how uh, nice it was to be in the same panel with Rashko. Uh, I already knew about him and I was very impressed by the paper given by my young colleague Anita. But unfortunately, I have very limited time and I will try to say several things. And um, I have to stop here with the thanks. Uh, obviously, uh, the chair, I'm very grateful to, to uh, Damas. There is a very strong trend in the reading of Marx today, in the last uh, 15, 20 years, in uh, North American universities, and it also became hegemonic somewhere else. The trend when you are forced, when you were forced to pronounce the word Karl Marx, the trend is that this author, the one with the beard that we know very well, is an author who was mostly able to talk about capital and class, was basically able to discuss labor. Some people said in a good way, some people were criticizing him. But there is a consensus by the new ideologies, postmodernism, a majoritarian trend in postcolonial studies that say that Marx was merely an author who had uh, an idea about Europe and that is not good at all for us in our society. So you see that in many programs they try to replace this white male with other theories, which would be very good actually to replace white males if the other theories, the new theories, would be as useful and radical as the theories of Marx, which is unfortunately what did not happen. So I spent the last couple of years of my research of Marx, publishing a book on the, the last period of his intellectual uh, um, development, biography, and I will try to talk about this in the remaining 18 minutes and a half. Um, there is a, a very uh, prestigious author, the director of the journal Subaltern Studies, his name is Rana Jitua. And Ramesh said many years ago something that, in my opinion, many of his followers did not listen carefully enough. He said that some of Marx's readings uh, have been taken in isolation and distorted. And this broad reading of Marx made Marx in a sort of cousin of a liberal author and in adulation that Marx was an author adulating technomaniac, so an author in favor, in absolute favor of capitalism. I found this very useful to think about this when some post-colonial authors thought about Marx in this way. Partha Chatterjee, another prestigious author, wrote that Marxism, Marxists had in general believed that this way of capital over traditional community was the inevitable sign of historical progress. In my opinion, this critique of Marxism is very useful, and I'm very glad to discuss about this. But there must be some differences between the thought of Marx and some economicistic and dogmatic reading of Marx. Because this definition, for me, it does not apply to Marx. So I don't want to miss the dimension of internationalism of Marx in the new century that we are starting, in the same way that, in my opinion, we miss another important concept, an essential concept of Marx, which is individual freedom. We miss the fact that Marx is a thinker in favor of the individual freedom in the 20th century, and we have to be careful among the different things that we do today. The work of Anita is special because it talks about gender, etc., but special, uh, we have to be careful about the international dimension. So in these two articles that I've been committed to uh, write for Ed Smelet, I they asked me to write about this debate, the last Marx, Eurocentrism, etc. I could not write about this if I, could, if I didn't clarify before what is the relation between Marx and capitalism. And uh, I have to read some quotations from now on, otherwise I will not be fast enough. But basically, as you know very well, Marx in all his writings writes in a positive way, in some, he highlighted some positive aspects of capitalism. For example, in the Communist Manifesto, they say that revolution failed because there was not enough development of the working class. 
And uh, this debate about post-colonial studies is basically focused on the article that Marx wrote at the age of 35, a short article for the newspaper, the Daily the New York Tribune, when Marx said that British colonialism is going to play a double role in India. And one of the roles is a positive role because it's destroying the negative side of the archaic and the religious superstitions. Marx wrote about um, civilizing tendencies of capitalism in the Grundrisse. And if you read Capital, there are, which is the most important book that he wrote, there are points in which Marx listed six uh, positive consequences about the introduction of capitalism. The cooperative labor process, the scientific technological contribution to production, appropriation of the forces of nature by production, creation of machinery that workers can only operate in common, economization of all means of production, and the tendency to creating a world market. These six points are seen by Marx as a progress, as a potential progress. That's the correct expression. Because Marx is obviously aware, as he was in 48, as he was in 53, of the misery, oppression, exploitation, alienation related to capitalism. But Marx is aware of the fact that a development of the economy, if it is related to a different mode of production, can bring in a development of the individuals. So Marx is talking about this also, an in relationship to the reorganization of the domestic sphere and to women's emancipation. Because Marx wrote in Capital that it is important that women enter in a socialized, organized process of production. And uh, this uh, does nevertheless create a new economic foundation for a higher form of the family and of the relationship between sexes. There are other quotations also from the documents of the First International that are very important from the point of view. So this first part of my presentation, the relationship between Marx and capitalism, you will follow similar quotation also if you look at political writings, short but very important, that Marx wrote after 1867, after the publication of capitalism. The critique of Gotha program, the critique of Bakunin, and the French uh, program they wrote in 1880. So what I'm trying to say, and I have to cut this part, otherwise my time is uh, running very quickly, that between the 40s, the middle of the 40s, the beginning of the uh, uh, what is called historical materialism, a uh, uh, sentence Marx never, Marx never pronounced, until the beginning of the 80s, Marx highlighted the fundamental relationship between the productive growth generated by capitalism and the precondition for the communist society. The research that Marx conducted in the last phase of his life, he died quite young, at 65, and he was very, very ill for many years. The research that he conducted in the last year of his life helped him to avoid falling into determinism and into the economicism that was so strong for many Marxists that interpreted him or tried to continue the, uh, what Marx did. So capitalism is a necessary point of translation. This is a quotation from the Grundrisse. Marx is writing about the dialectical role of capitalism. But this dialectical role of capitalism, Thomas, this has been studied here in Hungary as well, because there is a very strong literature in this country. I'm not talking about the big names like Lukas or Mezaros now, but the study of the Grundrisse, the Asiatic mode of production, has a very strong tradition in this country. I know I've been studying about this. So between 57, the Grundrisse, and 67, Marx is in this complicated, accidental part of trying to understand capitalism and the pre-capitalistic mode of production. But it is after capital that he expanded and was able to develop even more this consideration. Unfortunately for us, not in the way that he was able to write about it in a published form. So we have to be very careful to search through all these hundreds of notebooks and notes and unpublished drafts of capital post-67 and other things. 
So now I am already in the second part of my talk, which is the last writings, the late writings of Marx. And uh, this is an interesting conjunction of uh, personal research, intellectual research that Marx is conducting every moment he could, despite the dramatic personal life that he had also in these final years, and political demands. Marx writes most of the time for political demands, but now these political demands, Marx after the international is finally a little bit known because it was completely unknown before 1871, except a few circles of people. And Marx is receiving uh, reviews to his books or questions, letters, right? So there is an important review that was published in 1877 on a journal in Russia, the Patriotic uh, uh, Notes, because Capital was translated his last in Russia. It was uh, surprising, but it came before English translation and other translation. And Mikhailovsky, the populist leader, not in the negative sense that we use the word today, <coughs> wrote something and he attributed to Marx the idea that uh, capitalism must be an inevitable stage in the uh, story, history of Russia. So Mikhailovsky is saying, populism, you know, Marx, you are wrong. Berat Zasulic is writing a letter to Marx in 1881, 40 after, and she said, Marx, we would like to know what is your opinion about it, because we have to understand if we can do politics now, and therefore we can transform the communal land, the obshina, as we have in our country, or if we have to wait 80 years, 100 years, just playing chess, and waiting that capitalism arrives in our country, and then we can finally find some workers that we can give the flyers in front of the factory. So that's, and, and, and uh, Berat Zasulich said, this is a question of life and death for us. And Berat Zasulich said to Marx, all the Marxists here in Russia, all the Marxists said, that you are absolutely in favor of this, of capitalism as an inevitable step in history everywhere in the world. I'm mentioning this because it's related to what I said at the beginning of my talk, the accusation of philosophy of history, the accusation of Eurocentrism, the accusation of the conception that economic production must be the same and developing everywhere following the same path, the path of Europe, right? So Marx is taking uh, a lot of uh, uh, attention to these questions. And in my opinion, he wrote a response that was not good only for the present, but also for the future. Because there were so many Marxists and communists and socialists and social democratics that after him said, yes, this is the path. And there is feudalism, slavery, feudalism, capitalism, socialism, and communism. Amen. You know, we've been listening to this many, many times. So Marx wrote to Mikhailovsky and to Vera Zasulich, in particular to draft of this letter, Mikhailovsky letter was never sent, that in Capital, in particular using the French edition that was published five years after, I'm going to read this, the so-called primitive accumulation that he had described um, um, in the terms of how the solution of the economic structure of feudal society set free the elements of the economic structure of capitalist society was good only in Western Europe. So Marx said very clearly, not in a letter, but in Capital, French edition, 72, 75, this is what I understood in Western Europe, in the old continent. Only in England, I'm reading Marx, accomplished in a radical manner, but all other countries of Western Europe were following the same course, right? So that's an important um, thing that I want to say. And in response to Vera Zasulic, he said that Obshina could be the germ of a future socialist society. This seems to be the dates of the past, but they are not, because if you take uh, a flight, uh, in particular, a few years ago when the political conditions were better than today, this is a very strong debate that you find in Bolivia, in Ecuador, in Brazil. Like, what, are, what is the relation of progressive movements of the left with respect to capitalism? 
what are we going to do? What are we going to say? So what Max wrote here is not the key, the perfect solution for us today, but it is useful as a way of introduce, interpreting the world and using these categories to try to understand the issues of, of our society. So Max said, it is possible that Obshina must be overcome and capital will be introduced, but not because of a prerequisite of history. If this is happening, it is because we, as a political activist, have to try to understand the political circumstances, the social context that exists. And we can interpret the society only according to that not according to this dogmatic formula that Marx wrote in the preface of 1859, slavery, feudalism, capitalism, and communism. So the response to Marx is that socialist transformation of the obscena could happen without that capitalism is introduced in this necessary way. And this is possible. Marx wrote with Engels in the preface of the Communist Manifesto 1882, preface to Russian edition, because today in the world there are already capitalistic, capitalist sorry, relations. So this could be used by a society that has not developed that. Because Marx said, if it took hundreds of years to create a bank and to understand how a bank works, it does not mean that we have to start all from scratch. And the other clarification that I want to do is that Marx is not changing his ideas about socialism, about communism. It is constant, that's why I started with Marx's elaboration on capitalism. Socialism is for Marx something that must have at the center of the political project the intellectual and social developments of the individuals. So Marx is not thinking that socialism will be having this individual in a limited obscena with no political connection and no economical development. This is the socialism of Herzen, of others that Marx always criticized in his life. Marx is not changing dramatically his uh, ideas about socialism, but he's saying that we should not interpret history in the same way that he has been read by many postmodern neocolonialism or non-Marxist readers today. These debates about Russia are quite known, they were quite known, but in the past years, and I'm going to ask toward the end of my talk, in the past years, there has been publication of many other notebooks that Marx wrote at the end of his life. Or there will be more in the coming years. Or there are scholars like uh, Gavin Anderson, like myself, who are trying to work on these notebooks that are kept in Berlin, in Amsterdam, etc. So Marx could not publish these writings. He had no strength to finish the work, right? But he left many, many seeds that are useful for us today. And these seeds that Marx left sometimes will develop in beautiful flowers and plants also because of the doubts that he has. Because Marx is driving for himself, so he's not saying this is what is going to happen ABC. No, Marx is asking questions to himself. And these questions are very useful for us today. So I'm going to make some examples. From the end of the 70s, Marx is reading a lot of natural science. Because Marx wants to understand what is going on in the US with the, uh, the land, with the development of the rent, for example. And Marx is studying from Kowalewski, this book of common land ownership. So Marx is very interested in common and collective ownership, not in the end of the state, of an apparatus that controls everything in society, not at all. And when Marx is studying this, he's observing three countries, not Germany, France, and England, but Mexico, India, and Algeria. So these things are just not known. And if you keep reading only that sentence from the article on in India in 1853, obviously you will have uh, um, um, a bad understanding of Marx. So when Marx is studying uh, Mexico with Kowalewski, um, Marx is interested in the fact that there is a dissolution of the common land that accelerated after that the Spanish colonizers arrived there. When Marx is studying India, he shared with Kowalewski the hostility against British uh, um, rulers that came from outside with the colonizers. But also, he said, Kowalewski in his notes, you are wrong 
because you are trying to interpret the society by using European category of feudalism and projecting this category on India. It's written there, so this is a manifesto of anti-Eurocentrism. It is wrong. What we have in Europe in feudalism is different from this that is happening in the society. So Marx was highly skeptical about the transfer of interpretative categories between completely different historical and also geographical contexts. In Algeria, this note would be so interesting to compare with the Communist Party of France many decades after, right? When they were defending sometimes in some way the presence of France. So Marx is writing that the formation of private ownership is a necessary condition for the French, for the colonizers. Why? First of all, because it helps to procure as much land as possible to French settlers. And second, because it's against the form of supporting communist tendencies in the mind of the people there. So what I'm trying to tell you in a very superficial way with this quotation is that Marx is interested uh, in this common ownership and evaluates very positively common ownership. Marx is not this uh, neoliberal that say in capitalism everywhere, development everywhere. So the type of individualization of land ownership that Marx commented had not only secured huge economic benefit by the invaders, but has also achieved a political objective to destroy the foundation of this society. And today, if we destroy the common in our society in favor of more capitalism, there will be less chances to build a socialist alternative. Although we have to know that our socialist project, it is a project of internationalism, of development, and is a project in which a part of the development of capitalism is useful in order to have the six points that I read from the quotation before. So Marx is condemning European colonizers in many ways in these notebooks. And also Marx demonstrates his uh, idea that the presence of capitalism and colonialism in those countries is not providing anything positive to the population there. So I know that I must be very close to the end, but I want to say that yeah. in a lecture to the Solis, one minute, that's fine, Marx wrote all the British managed to do only one thing, to ruin native agriculture and to double the number and severities of famine. Right, there's only carousel, there's only destruction. This is what capitalism has generated everywhere it has been expanded in the world. Marx has also studied a lot of anthropology. I cannot tell you any word about this, otherwise Thomas would be very mean with me. But I want to tell you that Marx died at the end of his life by writing this chronological um, um, uh, uh, timeline of history. Uh, hundreds of pages he was writing from the beginning and he was paying attention to Middle East, not only to Europe. So that's the project that he's doing. And when he's doing this timetable, Marx still unpublished today, is not only writing about economics facts, but he's also writing about political events that determine different kind of capitalism. So it's not an economicistic point of view. Final consideration, Marx could not come about a fixed consequent sequence of predefined stages of society. Marx is not that. Marx denied that the development of capitalist mode of production was a historical inevitability in every part of the world. And Marx is pulls apart from the equation of socialism with productive force of production, which is one big problem that we have today if we want to address an essential issue today, ecology. Marx was more flexible in considering the interruption of, rev of revolutionary events and the subjective forces that shaped the revolutionary event, and Marx had a multilinear conception. He thought it possible that the revolution would break out in conditions and form that never considered before, that he started to consider when he opened himself completely to the world. So, Marx believed that the possibility for emancipation is in the end of the organization of the workers, 
of the working class, of the social movements, and not in the things of history. A very different reading compared to what uh, the uh, photograph, the picture of Marx's Eurocentrism is uh, presented today. Thank you.